the case studies that we'll be starting now uh, will basically delve into the on deep learning algorithms. So uh, we will see how deep learning algorithms are fooled. We'll see the case studies and uh, how those patches or the complexities in the uh, deep learning algorithms allow for unpredictability. Now, the problem with a bigger data or the problem with larger domain is that while you may know certain actions, there may be 100 other actions which you may not know about. This is closer to logic. So, for example, if you have to find uh, an honest person, if you have to find that uh, there is one dishonest man among the people, how would you do it? You can write the qualities of an honest man and you can write about the qualities of a dishonest man. And then you can find, is there an honest man in the group or is there a dishonest man in the group? But in logic, we do not do this. What do we do? We write the corollary. What we say, that it does not happen. There, there does not exist any member who is the member of a dishonest team? So while we are writing this formula, we are writing the corollary. We are writing the uh, reverse of it. In the same way, we have to be very careful about modeling or training our data as to what are the domains that we are capturing and is there any domain which is being left uncaptured? We'll, we'll, see, we'll see the example. So from now on, the further slides show how the algorithms are being fooled, right? So this is a new field called adversarial machine learning. Uh, the idea in adversarial machine learning is how can we trick the machine learning model by providing deceptive input? If you ever go to, uh, you know, defense uh, training or uh, uh, if, if you take NDA or CDS exams, there is an exam called uh, pilot aptitude battery test. Uh, you are allowed to take that exam only once in your life. What you have to do, you have to, uh, you have to make, you have to keep the point focused within a circle. And at the same time, you are supposed to hear something, that point keeps moving. If you hear something, you have to press a button. Why this is being done? Because they want that the pilot who would be commanding uh, you know the flight the, the fighter plane should be able to work independently with every sense whether it is hearing whether it's speaking whether it is using his hands or legs so he has to be uh, he has to be able to work against all these tricks all these threats right so uh, adversarial machine learning, basically it provides us methods to generate adversarial examples. And the basic objective is to cause the malfunction in an ML model. Now, what are the possible malfunctions? One of the possible mal malfunction is that either we can misclassify a correct object. So maybe there is a, there is a bird and I will say, no, this is a plane, right? Or I can classify an incorrect object. There is a plane, and I want the answer as bird. I will say this is a bird. So these are the two basic ideas. So let's uh, start with adversarial examples. But before that, there is a term called adversarial patches. Now, within adversarial machine learning, we use these patches. These patches provide us techniques which are devised to fool the machine learning models. It can either be a, a uh, physical obstruction, or it can be generated random photos through uh, various algorithms. Uh, they have been proved high success rate against real world computer vision system. Some patches are very local. So these patches might work on a, on certain, um, certain uh, domains also, whereas some of the patches are there, which are universal. So they always work. So let's see the first example. What do you see? We have, how many persons do you see here? Anyone? 
in this two. picture, how many persons? Two. two. Right. No, sir. There are two. But what we have done is that we have put. Can you see this? Oh, sorry. Can you can you see this? Can you see my mouse cursor, please? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So this yes. is a patch. Because of this patch, the algorithm did not classify this person as a person. Should it have or should it not have? Should have. Should have. Uh... So this is a classic example of an attack using patch, right? Now there are many more examples in patches. So let me give you some zoom in. Is this visible? Yes. Okay. So what is happening here is that this is a person and we apply a patch. Now this patch is blank. So after a blank patch, he is still classified as person. But when we give this colored patch, the algorithm does not recognize. Okay, that's fine. Now, not recognizing may not be a problem, but misrecognition can be a bigger problem. So see, in this picture, this is a person and this is a bicycle. And initially, the model recognizes both the objects. We put a blank patch, and still the model succeeds in classifying both of them. The moment we put this colored patch, it's the same patch, mind it. It's the same patch that is being used everywhere. So we are talking about a universal patch in this case. It stops recognizing the person, only recognizes the bicycle. Okay, fine. There are two persons. So now the question comes, is it able to fool only one person in machine learning or it is able to fool the whole class of labels? Let's see. So here we have a handbag, we have two persons, we have a bench, we have a dog. Okay, fine. Now we have a patch. Rather, we have two patches. Still, we have five objects. One, two, three, four, five. The moment we have these two patches placed on persons, the handbag is gone and the persons are gone. So it's an attack on three labels. Right? However, some of us some of them, it might not work. Like in this case, the person continued to be identified by the model. Now, in these examples, either they were classified or they were not classified. That, but we haven't seen any misclassification so far. So let's see. This is a person. This is a handbag. Fine. Still a person. Handbag is gone. And now it becomes a third thing called dining table, right? So stage-wise, even the blank patch has been able to remove one label and the colored patch has been able to not only remove both labels, but also allowed for misclassification of the object. Uh, in this case, it is just the removal um, the label, right? So, now it is easy to think, okay, this is only for, you know, pictures, but our data is still safe. You know, our audio is safe, our video is safe. Um, the machine learning algorithms will continue to work nicely on other bits and pieces. Let's have a look. This is a speech to text. So I'm speaking and someone is converting it into a text. This is the original one. Where the speech to text says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now what we have done is that the attacker has carefully crafted a noise. 
and the noise is only 0.001%, which is kind of not a very big noise that, you know, uh, algorithms will try to uh, capture. And the moment you add this noise, what does it become? It is a truth universally acknowledged that a singer or whatever. So I, um, I recommend reading a lot of literature. So I am sure you will be uh, given access to these uh, uh, slides. What I have done is uh, at every slide, I have tried to give you the reference from where you can read uh, the details, right? Self-driving cars are a new phenomena and there are uh, experiments being done at Berkeley University using deep learning algorithms. So you can see this deep drive dot berkeley dot edu. Um, now they have host of uh, such experiments. Uh, is this uh, is the browser visible or the presentation? Presentation. Okay. okay. No worries. So uh, you, you can go to this site and find about more. But what we are seeing here is that this is a drive-by test. Now, what do you see the sign? The sign is stop, right? What the attacker has done or the experiment has done is that they have put some patches over here which can be due to pollution or due to erosion of paint. And just to see if the system is still able to recognize correctly. What they say, say is that this stop sign is misidentified as a speed limit sign after a while. Depends on number of frames that you process, but the self-driving cars can be fooled very easily. So rather than stopping, you know, they'll start following a certain speed limit. Also, even if it is 20, it can be very dangerous, right? Even if it is five, because you might have something uh, like a lake a little bit ahead. There are some more examples. So it can be that due to fog, it can be blurry. So this is this is a truck sign, which is recognized as this. Uh, this is a right turn sign, but because of visibility, it is recognized as slippery road. Uh, this is work ahead. It is recognized as this. I don't remember. I think it's parking or something, but it is very easy to fool the self-driving cars by changing the resolution of uh, the images. There are examples of fooling the neural networks. So you see, this is a uh, school bus. When the school, same school bus is seen from an angle, it is recognized as a garbage truck and that too with 99% probability. In this case, this is a punching bag, and now it becomes a snow globe. So the same object with different uh, projections can give you a different result. Scooter can become a parachute or a bobsled, again a parachute. The fire truck can become school bus or a fireboat. So the neural networks are very, very easy to fool. We, people have demonstrated. And, you know, if there is an automated system, uh, what do you do if you see a fire truck? If you are driving, then you should let it pass, right? Same is not true for a school bus. If you have a school bus behind you, or if there is an automated car, it, if it finds a school bus behind itself, behind itself, it will not maybe give a pass because there is, there is no such rule. School school bus is no in no hurry. But if it is a fire truck, the basic rule suggests that you should give it a pass. You should allow it to go by, you know, stopping in the side. That will not happen. So it, it's, it's a major risk. Uh, the most famous example of adversarial no noise attack is this picture. So if you read any paper about machine learning uh, adversarial attacks, you will find this image. In this image, uh, it is recognized as Panda with 57.7% confidence. When you add a little bit of noise, it becomes given with 99.3% of confidence. 
So it's very easy to misclassify picture and which gives uh, us two classes of attack categories. One is called untargeted attack and another is called targeted attack. Very, very simple. So untargeted attack, we just want, so if, if you ask the attacker, what is your target? Sir, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have any target. I have only one target that I do not want this to be labeled as panda. That's it. Right? So my interest lies that the answer should not be correct. That's it. So if it is anything other than panda, my work is done. We do not want the correct result. This can happen only if the attacker has access to the model. And just like we study in testing, you know, in white box testing, we have the access to the code. Here also, uh, the attacker will have access to the model, at least how it works and everything. In targeted attack, I'm not only interested, I, I'm, I'm not interested what the picture is. I want this to be sounding. I want this picture to be labeled as mobile, irrespective of what it is. And that is why, so we have a specific target. We know what should be the answer, right? And that is why it is targeted. So in untargeted attack, we want a specific correct result, but in targeted attack, we want a specific incorrect result. It is also known as uh, black box attack because uh, the attacker does not have access to the model. There are more attacks. Uh, so the attacker can either attack the model it can attack the algorithm or it can maybe poison the data. So uh, evasion is one category of attack, uh, which is uh, an attack on the learned model such as an actual classifier. So it allows it to evade certain inputs or you know, to give wrong weights or to uh, give new classes of labels with additional weights. Similarly, there is an attack called poisoning which is an attack on algorithm itself, such as uh, least square regression learning. So if you have uh, been working on uh, machine learning, you must have heard about this. So the basic objective in all these attacks remains to cause malfunction in an ML model. And as, I, as we discussed, the malfunction can be uh, in either of the ways, either to uh, produce a correct result or an incorrect. In, when we talk of cyber attacks or remote attacks, right? This is the most uh, prominent one, which is which is data data poisoning. So data poisoning takes a completely different view. Uh, so we do not attack model here. We do not attack uh, the algorithm. What we do is we inject malicious inputs, and based on inputs, uh, because as I understand, whatever little I know of uh, machine learning. Uh, is the voice not clear? Because I saw a message that voice is clear on YouTube. Well, if, if you want to shift to, yeah. So it's, it's fine, sir. Fine. Sir. So yes. So uh, the success of the model, I believe, depends on the quality of data. So if you can somehow um, poison the training data, then the whole uh, the whole conclusions will, will, will cease to be wrong. Um, there is this joke that, you know, when kids ask about something that we don't want to tell them, we start telling them, you know, stories. So, uh, you know, what is this? Oh, no, 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 this is, this has nothing to do with, you know, this is, this is only for, um, you know, adults. Kids are not supposed to talk about that. So what you're doing is, uh, it's, it's kind of incomplete information. And then when, when those kids are exposed to the real situation, uh, they are not able to comprehend what to do because uh, that particular label has not been, you know, fed into that, 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 that brain. So if you, uh, if you poison, if the attacker can poison the data, what we can do, I mean, the model should try and reject, but then again, it comes down to the possibility of whether it can identify which one is the malicious data and which one is the uh, actual data. You have to remember that what are the powers of an attacker. So an uh, attacker can either inject, attacker, attacker can replay, or attacker can block the data. So 
attacker does not only need to inject the wrong data, what it can do is it can block the correct training data for, uh, from going into, uh, uh, into the algorithm so that it will never be processed, right? So one is poisoning and another is evasion. And obviously it can, uh, it can see uh, the output, which is extraction. So as, as we said, using all this, what we can do, we can either misclassify a correct object or classify an incorrect object. So attacker can redirect uh, the data server to one controlled by it. Let's say this is the training data. Rather than allowing this algorithm to get its training data from here, this attacker can set up its own server and then start sending the data to the algorithm from that server. So this, this is a classic example of a cyber attack on machine learning algorithm. What we have done, it's called simple redirection attack. In this redirection attack, what will happen is that uh, the attack, uh, the, the model or the machine will not recognize that it has been tricked into getting data from somewhere else. And it is very much possible. I mean, we, we all know about phishing attacks. We all know about uh, redirection attack, right? So that's what uh, can happen here. Attacker can also selectively remove some inputs, which it can block, you know, using evasion. Uh, so some, it can, it can stop some inputs from reaching, reaching the system. It can inject malicious inputs such as emails or domain names to classify or misclassify the correct inputs. So from here, it can inject. So this is injection, this is blocking, and then you can have a uh, misdirection. These all are the tools available to uh, the attackers for mayor data poisoning, right? Now, the final question, we have seen enough examples of an attack, but how can we defend? Is there any way to defend it? Uh, anyone would like to say something on this? We know that you can, so in, in, in software engineering, we read about something called software testing. And the moment we start reading about software testing, we also say it is virtually impossible to trace each and every control path, right? Control flow, we create a control flow graph and then we take the shortest path and all. Similarly, since the data set is huge, uh, the possibilities are immense, there always remains there always remains a possibility that such kind of attacks can happen. So how do we defend it? So just a reminder, what we are doing till now in machine learning is, is A being labeled as A? Is B being labeled as B? Right? We also need to ask two more questions. Is there anything else other than A which is being labeled as A? Or is there any possibility that A is being labeled as anything other than A? This is, these two are very important points. So if I'm Rajiv, system should recognize me and me only as Rajiv. Okay? If it recognizes someone else, as Rajiv, and it is because of adversarial uh, adversarial uh, disturbance, then it is an attack. If it recognizes me as not Rajiv, and it is because of, uh, not because of uh, the algorithm uh, error, but because of some inputs or some external factors, then also it is an attack. So how do we defend? The first line defense People have tried a lot of uh, defense strategies that we should uh, add noise at the test time and see if it still works. Uh, there have been evasions and that has not worked properly. Maybe adding noise at the training time, uh, even that has failed as proper defense. Uh, maybe weight decay or error, error correcting codes, all these have not. So we, for defense strategies, first of all, we have to 
understand and we have to expect that there will be problems. There will be failures. And the failures would be because of something that we have not taken into account. In quotes, expect the unexpected. So if your algorithm, if your system is ready to expect the unexpected and then handle it also. When I give my students uh, a simple code to write down, you know, uh, whether it is a leap year or not, um, they, they create a program. And then I tell them, okay, uh, perform some validations, checks. I mean, you, you all must have done it in academics, um, either as a student or uh, faculty. So when they do it and they say, oh, sir, this, this is working fine. 1900 is not a leap year and 2000 is a leap year, even though 1900 is divisible by four. So they, they take into account all of them. When I test it, I just type A, B, C, D and the program fails. They say, no, 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 sir, you have entered an incorrect input. So are they correct? No. They should have taken into account that user can enter almost anything. And that is where uh, the adversarial ML uh, gets its strength from, because we forget to validate some of the edge cases, so to speak. So what we should be doing is, we should be training the system on the actions for input beyond expectations. Uh, there are multiple uh, defensive strategies. The first and very uh, promising one is heuristic defense. What do we do in heuristic defense? Uh, in heuristics, we learn and learn and relearn through feedback. In the same way, we should not only train the model to correctly identify something, we should also train the model to behave properly during an attack. So we should simulate an attack situation. And during that attack situation, we should try to break the model. Till now, what has been done is that uh, if there is a, a label, we have tested the model by giving it you know, some other picture and seeing if it, if, it is, if it labels the same or correct or incorrect labels. So the whole focus has been on correctly or incorrectly labeling everything. What, what we suggest now is that you should simulate an attack situation and see how the system behaves in that attack situation. If it goes beyond the expected line, you should readjust the weights and everything to bring it back to the correct one. Uh, in this, there are no theoretical guarantees. Uh, there is another one called certified defense, where you know what kind of uh, attack will happen, or you can simply uh, you know, stop the model uh, because there is an upper bound, or then there is always this cat and mouse game, like uh, you did something, then the attacker, attacker came up with a new uh, you know, attack, then you came up with a new defense, and this keeps working. And this is the third one is the most popular in uh, cyber attack and everything, right? So I'll give you concrete examples of two cases and then, then, then I'll wrap, wrap it up. So first one is called adversarial training. Now in every, uh, every machine learning model, uh, this is kind of becoming a norm that we should provide it adversarial training. What do we do in this? So if you see these two pictures, uh, this is labeled as bird. Uh, this is not the same picture with a different resolution. So obviously the bird class has a decreased probability in this case. However, we train it that even if it is a decreased probability, you should not uh, you know, see anything but you should classify it as uh, bird only, right? That, that's one thing. So uh, the basic rule here is that it relies on having labels for all the possible examples. If you have any example, label it. Whether with high probability or low probability does not matter, but do not forget the labeling. Second one is that this is, this relies on training without labels. So 
what we will do since this is an unlabeled we will make some guesses the guesses will be okay it's probably a bird it's probably a uh, plane it's probably a sky uh, excuse me give give me a Sir, you are muted. Wait, wait. Ajit, sir? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. There was, there was some disturbance uh, at the door. Okay. So, yes. So, in this case, since this is... Uh, uh, this is an unlabeled one. What, what we are doing is that we are saying it's probably a bird or a plane. So it will provide it some weight and some probability. What we have to do is make sure that in second case, it can still be probably a bird or maybe a plane. What we have to do now is that we should not allow to change the guess. Right? So what we did in earlier one is that if we started with a label, we made sure that every possible example had a specific label. In this case, since we do not have labels, what we did is that we provided various options. All these options are, you know, a starting point. What we are saying is that later on, attacker should not be allowed to introduce a new option. So attacker might put some patch or anything. But what we are saying is that if you have seen something earlier, if you are seeing a similar thing later on, pick one of the earlier guesses and not the new guesses. Right? So these are uh, two defense mechanisms. One is adversarial training and then another is a virtual uh, adversarial training. So in conclusion, uh, the adversarial machine learning is a new and emerging field of research. Uh, there are lots of examples where the machine learning is being used in cybersecurity for attacks as well as defenses. Uh, so the, the bottom line is that it is not only important to have the correct model, but also ensure that model is robust against adversarial machine learning. Just like in moral studies, we say, you know, we should teach all the good things. But there is an another definition which says, we should not only teach the students about what is right, we should also tell them about what is wrong. So in the same way, the algorithm should not only be able to point out or define or label the correct label as correct one, it should also make sure that it never labels a correct one as incorrect or incorrect one as correct. So uh, where does all this come from? Because every model expects a certain class of input. So if you are, let's say, uh, expecting a model to uh, see if I am a high net, high net worth individual or if I am in a middle class or a lower middle class, uh, it will expect, you know, some values in terms of income. But here, what we are, uh, if you if you start entering the, only the names or the strings, I don't know how the model will behave. Uh, we should train the model to uh, learn against, defend against uh, uh, adversarial patches. And obviously, the defense is not very easy. As um, th this is this is very tricky. So I'll I'll like to devote some time on it. So defense is not easy because the model is trained to recognize one kind of adversarial attack may be fooled by another designed to fool its de detector. So that additional effort that you made in identifying the adversarial patch or adversarial attack, that itself may be fooled or that may introduce some other side effects. Right? Just like in medicine, when, when the doctor tells you, okay, uh, this, this might cure your infection, but it might lead to diarrhea or it might lead to some, some other, other issues. 
So similarly, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, obviously, it's an arm race. So if someone asks me, is there a perfect secure system? The answer is no. Uh, is there a secure system? Yes, because there is no absolute security per se. The security depends on, uh, you know, uh, the chance, the risk, the probability. So if you ask me if this lock is good enough, if this lock is secure, the answer is, if I lock the door, if I go out for six hours, if the lock takes more than six hours to break, yes, it is secure. Because by the time the attacker will start unlocking this door, I'll be back. So my security requirement is only for six hours. That lock is fine. I don't want to spend it. In the same way, uh, the algorithms or the machine learning should also have uh, all such bounds. So uh, that's it from me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much, sir, for a very good, very nice lecture. Participant, please ask questions to sir if you have any kind of doubt, any queries. Hello, sir. So there is a question, sir? if the malicious and attacker are the same. Yes, so malicious party or the attacker is same. Malicious is intent. Malicious is intent. So the question was, is the malicious and attacker the same? Yes. So malicious means with with bad intention and attacker also. You can use them interchangeably. Sir, in the normal programming, we use the internet security like the encryption. Can we use encryption in ML uh, algorithms or not? So it depends on what kind of ML algorithms are you talking about. Just give me a second. Yeah, sorry. So the answer to your question is why encryption? What do you want to safeguard against? So let's say if you have an image, right? And if you encrypt that image, what will happen? I can still change it, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you send me your image, a password protected image, as an attacker, I can remove that image. I can send my password protected image. So encryption is not going to solve anything. It depends on the purpose. You should always, you should always think about what is the goal. So is the goal data security? Maybe yes, uh, but I do not see how it will fit into you know the machine learning scheme of things. So if you can give me more context, then maybe I'll be able to answer it. Anything else? Any other? Yeah, there is a one question, sir, in chat box. Okay, let me read it. Yeah. Attackers can change the type like fish. Uh, okay. So which type of algorithm we use to train our model to remove the type of attack because attackers can change the type link phishing and many more. Again, what you can do is only to train your model in adversarial setting. So rather than waiting for attacker to attack your system, you should try to emulate this situation and see how the system behaves. Right? Rather than waiting for the system to behave irrationally, uh, you should try and you know uh, have the system uh, ready uh, to deal with such attacks. Uh, to, to at least face face such attacks and see how, how it behaves and what reverse actions or what actions you need to take that, that is more important. Let me see if there is another question. No. Anyone else? Any other question, please? Any more queries? Sir, sir is it same about, as... I mean, machine learning, you can ask about cybersecurity, not necessarily. Yes, please. Sir, is it same as uh, image forgery and video forgery like that, sir? The... Topic you have covered. See, pulling ML algorithm is same. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir, yes, sir. It's a good question. So, image forgery is what? Image forgery is trying to change one image with another, right? 
Yes, yes, sir. Maybe some part of the image or whole image itself. Yes. What is the goal? That is the question. If the goal is that by forging that image, you have been able to fool the machine learning algorithm, then yes, it is an example of adversarial attack. Right? If it is, uh, if it does not matter if that image is changed, um, it will just add it into a repository, maybe label something and that continue. Of image leads to, I would call it an adversarial example. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, so the implementation part of this uh, problem can be done using which uh, software, sir? which application? I don't think it's about application. I think it's about modeling. So if you if you do the machine learning, how you how how you how do you make how do you do perform the training in machine learning? So it is it is that particular part which is which is, I'm going to attack. So if you are if you are using Python, maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll use Python or I I can do black box right. I don't need to uh, have. I don't, don't need to get into your system. All I'll do is I'll only provide the inputs. That's it. Right? I don't need to uh, develop the system. There are, there are huge examples of how to develop uh, adversarial patches. So, okay. Uh, it's a good question. Let me give you some examples. See, there are websites like these where you can see different examples and there are libraries which it supports. You know, it has a lot of classes of attacks. Uh, there are adversarial patches. So you, you can go through them if you want. And I'll share the link. Right? So if you are interested in developing and using that. There is one question, sir. There are any time duration to find out cyber attack? Any time duration to find out cyber attack? Hmm. How do you find out if there has been a burglary in your house? <laughs> right? So it's the answer is as simple as that. When do you check it? Any more queries, participants? Anyone? I mean, you, you, you can ask from cybersecurity, you can ask from yeah. machine learning in cybersecurity. There's no need. Are there? and, and please give me some honest feedback. If someone can give me, how can I improve or how would you like it, not like it? Anything. Any more queries, participant? Ruby, ma'am, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, sir, for your uh, very good and very strong uh, lecture. Now, I would like to have 10 minutes left. I, I expected some questions, and that is why <laughs> you know, I kept like 10, 10 minutes for questions. But, anyways, yeah. Hello? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello. No, uh, yeah. There is a, I think someone is asking something. Yeah, sir, good afternoon, sir. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, good afternoon. I am Dr. Thiruvall HLV from Chennai, Roman Arts College in Andalam. Sir, yes, really, it's a very interesting session. Actually, in machine learning, we know supervised and supervised learning and associated algorithms only. But it's really a good topic. We don't know about the attacks in machine learning. Thank you, ma'am. That is the idea. Uh, yeah, as I said in the beginning, yes, I don't yes. want to make you a specialist of something in one hour. 
<laughs> but I just wanted to give you a new flavor into an area which I know is very um, not talked about much in detail. So many a times you <clears throat> should try and you know uh, get uh, acquainted with newer and newer areas uh, which can help us you know widen our uh, research and study horizon. So thank you, ma'am, for your. Uh, no, sir. Comments. We haven't heard so far that the word at all adversarial. Sorry, how far it should be useful for our research work, for our scholars in machine learning or some other. Only for, for security purpose, attacks only we are using. Is there any algorithm separately? No, ma'am. It is, it is not only about attacks. So it is, first of all, try to understand this is not about cyber attacks, no. right? It is adversarial attacks. And adversarial attacks simply means any action done with the wrong intent. What can be the wrong intent? That someone can be misclassified or something wrong. So mm. you are in a college, okay? Mm. In your college, what you want two things. A student should only be able to write his own exams. Mm. And no one who is not a student should be able to write the exams. And now you have a you know automated machine learning system which can identify the students and all. If anyone tries to break <laughs> into that system, using whatever means does not necessarily need, mean to be uh, does not need to be uh, a cyber attack. The best example of this I'll give you. Student said there was a there was a question paper. Who is the prime minister of India? Mm. And someone wrote Ramlal, mm. right? The, he, he got zero marks. He went to the yeah, teacher. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the teacher said, it's a wrong answer. Mm. And he said, ma'am, but I looked it online. Oh. Right? And then online, it says the prime minister of India is Ramlal. On some mm. of the website. Can you stop me from doing that? Mm. So what did the attacker do? Or what did... Uh, what happened there that rather than going to the official website, I forwarded this information from an unofficial website. The research, that the answer that you get from Google, is it true? No. no. The answer that you get from Google, it's a search engine, it gives you, I mean, right now Google has become very intelligent, but five years back, it would only give you the link where you can find the answer, not the answer itself. Now it has started giving the answers. Right? So if your link is wrong, so if I can feed the database with the wrong information, the answer will also be wrong. So how to protect my data, how to uh, protect my algorithm, how to protect the result. We, have, we can talk about everything and we, we can do some research. Yes, okay. very good question. Okay, fine, sir. Thank you. Okay. I think there there is, more queries? Yes, yes. I think there is... Okay. Yeah. More queries? Any more queries, participant? Okay. Uh, I'm happy to share my email if you have any queries. Uh, okay, please, please share it and please share your PPT also, sir. Yes, I will. I will email you. Okay, sir has shared his uh, email address in chat box rrsing.du and other at gmail.com. If you have any kind of query, you can text to me. Sir, excuse me, sir. My information is online. So. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah. excuse me, sir, uh, myself only. Sir, is there any uh, special tutorial or book How or anything regarding this adversarial adversarial attack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you go on YouTube, there are three oh. or four very good videos. If you oh, just like oh. adversarial machine learning, machine learning. Uh, there are some Stanford, some Google videos, and they're really, really uh, mm. comp technical. Okay, so there is one question from Jeeva Ratinam. Okay. Uh, how do we know the source of malicious software? Uh, there are various ways to know uh, the source of malicious software. So when the system downloads any software, there is always a log. So so you, you, you can check the log and from there, using forensics, uh, we can know. Okay, I think... Uh, sir, I have given the most of the answer of the most of queries in a very nice manner. If you have any queries, still you can ask. We have two or three minutes more. 
Okay, so uh, now I, I would like to request Ruby ma'am to propose a word of thanks. Thank you, Ruby. sir. Uh, sir, it's my privilege to give a word of thanks to Rajiv Ranjan, sir. I thank you for a very insightful and engaging session where we not only were entitled with adversarial attack examples, but are also taught multiple defense strategies to be adapted with more need for adversarial training to adversarial machine learning as emerging field of research. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I wholeheartedly thank uh, Bishak, sir, Pawan, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and every participant much, made it interesting. Uh, uh, let let me say this out loud. Uh, not I mean I I get invited to various webinars and all, uh, but this was really an effort. Uh, disclaimer: I'm not a machine learning expert, so uh, but um, I'm from cybersecurity. But this one is an emerging field, and that is why I thought uh, that I should I should introduce to the larger audience because I haven't seen this topic being talked about in uh, our current research literature. So if anyone is interested in collaborating with me for research, for the research, uh, you can share your proposal with me and uh, I'll be more than happy to work with you. Maybe learn a lot. Sure, of things. It, it sure, was sir. very effective session, sir. It was very, really a nice session. Uh, so I, I hope people enjoyed it. I hope people got something from it. We have also enjoyed, sir. It was, indeed, it was a very good lecture, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Please, uh, I have sent you a receipt, sir, and please share your PPT and receipt. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll do that later today. I, I now have got lectures. Thank you, thank you. Have, have a great day. Okay. Okay, participants, uh, uh, the next lecture will be started at 2.50. We have a tea break. Okay. Sorry, excuse uh, me, sir. Sir? Sir, yeah. I mean, sir, in natural things, I don't know how to enter the time. When I enter AM or PM, it shows invalid time. I have yeah. the problem in the morning. Yeah. Listen, ma'am, actually, I have given separate link for the morning and evening attendance. Okay? Yeah, that, that is not a problem, sir. While entering a session, PM means yeah. it said it's a not invalid time. In the afternoon yeah. attendance only, I'm telling you, sir. Please. I'm, I'm not understanding what you're telling me. It is regarding the attendance, ma'am. Sir, sir, in the attendance link, when I enter the attendance, while entering all the details, date and time column will come, no? In the date, date and time, ma'am, no. Date and time, no. Is, no. date and time is regarding at which time you are filling the attendance. Okay, date, today's date, I, in the menu I have taken the today's yeah, date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At which yeah. time you are filling, you are okay. filling the For time, sir, what should I enter? AM and PM only so. But the time you are feeling, okay? Okay, so yeah, I have to fill the time. What time? In, the time? in, in morning, it, it will be a.m. and evening, it will be p.m. automatically. Okay, sir. So I have to enter 2.30 or 4.20 like that. I have to enter the time. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now I understand. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And we will join, okay, at 2.50. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, it will be going to a very nice lecture uh, uh, delivered by... Uh, Dr. Indranath Chatterjee, okay, he's from South Korea, okay, so please have patience and be there, okay, we will be back within a 10 minutes, okay, thank you. It is a tea break for 10 minutes.
नमस्कार सर नमस्कार इंदना सर नमस्कार सर यस 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 प्लीज ओपन योर कैमरा सर या लेट मी जस्ट for the next lecture uh, uh, today's resource person is dr indana chatterjee uh, is from uh, department of computer science and engineering at uh, tongmong university busan south korea i would like to uh, uh, request uh, dr abhishek bansal sir to introduce dr chatterjee okay sir okay Th thank you very much sir uh, it is my honor to introduce eminent professor dr Indranath Chatterjee Dr Indranath Chatterjee is working as a professor in the department of computer engineering at Thongmyeong University Busan South Korea He received his PhD degree in computational neuroscience from the department of computer science University of Delhi Delhi He his research area includes computational neuroscience schizophrenia medical imaging fMRI and machine learning He has authored and edited more than 8 books on computer science and neuroscience published by renowned international publishers he has published numerous research papers in international journals and conferences he is receiving the various global awards on neuroscience he is currently serving as a chief section editor of a few renowned international journals and serving as a member of advisory board and editorial board of various international journals dr chatterjee is an internationally acclaimed advocate of open science he is personally working on several project of government and non government organization as pi and copi related to medical imaging and machine learning for a broader societal impact in collaboration with several university globally he is an active professional member of the association Association of Computational Machinery (ACM) USA, Organization of Human Brain Mapping (OHBM) USA, Federation of European Neuroscience Society (FENS) Belgium, Association of Clinical Neurology and Mental Health, and International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility. So, sir, with this brief introduction, I welcome you, sir. and invite you to de deliver a lecture on natural language processing sir over to you sir thank you thank you so much sir for the very warm welcome and uh, really thank you for inviting me to give a talk over here so it's my privilege but i'm really sorry to reschedule my talk from 25 to 27 i'm thankful to dr pawan also for uh, allowing me to reschedule because uh, it was very severely affected covid that time So yes, I am fine, and I'm really happy to present my today's lecture. So, sure. so may I start? Sure, sir. Sure. Uh, okay. Please, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. So let me just share my screen. Please let me know if the whole full screen is visible. It, it is visible, sir. It is quite yeah. quite visible. Please start your slide soon. Uh, yes let me just uh, slide is the whole full screen visible yes sir yes sir yeah, okay okay please go ahead sir thank you so much so welcome everyone so today as uh, instructed by dr abhishek that i am going to give you a presentation on the natural language processing and it's a field of ai ml dl and all these things i'll describe you uh in detail in the upcoming slides so before getting into the detail of the natural language processing we have to know that what we are going to cover in this uh talk so natural language processing we will we see the 
aspect of the future of communication. We'll see the different perspective. We'll, we'll see the dim different dimensions of it, of uh, different uh, aspects that we usually work with natural language processing. So I'll try to finish it within one hour. And uh, if you have any question, you can, in, in the meantime, you can drop your uh, messages. Uh, I mean, your question in the chat box. And uh, if I get a pop-up message, I'll reply you soon. So as I told you that when we talk about the natural language processing, we come up with a mind that the future of communication. So when we talk about the future of communication, we 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 obviously think about the different uh, different aspects of communication. Like it can be a kind of uh, oral communication, verbal communication. It can be a written communication, electronic communication. So all these kind of communication we mainly divide the communication into two parts, the medium of communication and ease of communication. So we are not talking about the medium of communication here in today's lecture, because we are all aware of the different kinds of communication media, but we will talk about the ease of communication. So ease of communication means how well we can make our communication easier for our better future communication. So when, so what is the future that comes up when we talk about the communication structures like for example when we talk about the uh, man to human to human communication when we talk about the human to machine communication when we talk about the machine to machine communication so it it needs to be uh, very much advanced in a, in a way that we are dealing with nowadays with huge amounts of uh, multiverse communication what what we say in, from different dimensions right so here we gradually look after about the different ease of communication. So when we talk about the communication, the first thing that came up in your mind that it's the human language. Now you can tell us that, uh, okay, you, what, what is the special about human language? Why do we need human language uh, to uh, learn? Because human language must be very easy that we, we every day speak and we communicate within each other with the human language. But, but trust me, Human language is the most ambiguous and it's it's a, it's a very difficult kind of language, like what we are dealing with any kind of programming language or formal languages. So they are very much ambiguous. So it's, it's a very specifically constructed language or uh, maybe we can say a, a, a kind of prototype or a kind of thing that we, we use to convey some kinds of meaning. So as we know that the little kids, when it's try to learn a language, maybe any kind of language, it's, it's mother language or the any foreign language, any kind of language that kids try to learn, it try to learn with different kinds of uh, different kinds of verbal expressions and different kinds of uh, bodily expressions, right? So human language is a kind of discrete, symbolic, and categorical signaling system. Presumably, because of greater signaling reliability. That means when we talk, when we human talk, we never talk with just only with our voice, right? We we obviously use different face, uh, different uh, what can I say? Di different face expressions, different body gestures, different hand gestures, different different tone, different sounds, and different with different writings. So we we uh, express our feelings. We pre express our words with different kinds of uh, expression along with the uh, vocal tone or the vocal voice that we speak about that particular language. So it's very ambiguous because like I, I told you, so not only with the help of the word, with the help of the hand expression, face expression, eyebrow expression, eye expression, and all these things, we, we can decode the language in a different form to each of the person, right? So now ease of communication that I talk, that I was talking about. So that ease of communication is very important. For example, every one of you have known that for a better verbal communication, you have to be speed more sophisticated way, more interpretable, more productive, and with less error. 
So for example, this person, when it comes for an interview and the person asks something and he's saying so much of thing all together that this person is thinking, oh my God, this person must be a crazy person. So he's just uh, uh, pressing the alarm button. So it, it feels so when your words are not well, uh, are, are not well interpretable, are not more productive and have a lot of errors, have no meaning, have no proper sentence formation, this, this communication, maybe in a good English, maybe in a good language, maybe in a good Bengali or whatever the language you speak, but, but, but if the language is not properly comprehensive, then it is not properly interpretable. Then it's not a good way of communication. So when we talk about the communication and all these things, before starting the core NLP part, so I want to briefly uh, get you to the uh, the concept of NLP, that why NLP is important and what is NLP and all these things. So before we learn about the NLP, we have to learn about the L, that is the linguistic. So linguistic is a very systematic study or a very scientific study, we may say, which study the structure and evolution of human language. So it, it, it involves many different uh, kinds of studies like the phonological study, the morphological study, semantical study, a lot of studies which deals with the linguistics and it's connect with different other kinds of subjects like the psychology, anthropology, neuroscience, uh, human psychology, philosophy, computer science, and all these things are very much connected with the linguistic. Now, when we talk about the NLP and when we talk about the linguistic, the computational part of the linguistic is what we call as NLP. So computational linguistic is a scientific and engineering discipline. It's not our, uh, I mean, it's not humanities department, not the philosophical part, but the engineering discipline, which concerned with understanding of written and spoken language from a more computational perspective. So theoretical goals of the computational linguistic includes the formulation of the grammatical and the semantical framework and characterizing the different languages. So the so development of the more cognitively available and neuroscientifically plausible computational models to understand the structure and the evolution of the language, to understand the basic, uh, the scheme of the language within the particular kind of the structure is very important in that. So computer language, computational linguistic actually helps in that. So with the help of computational linguistic and with the help of AI, we build a new kind of technology called natural language processing. So, so for any layman, for example, if you, if, for example, if I if I just take a grant that 80% of you are not aware of the natural language processing, even though if I ask you that what is natural language processing, what do you mean by the natural language processing, you will gradually, you will eventually just bring in your mind that ah, natural language processing must be something like the, the auto correction in the uh, Gmail or the uh, auto for the the automatic form filling in the Google or the automatic typing in the Google or the Google translation, that's the most important part which your mind or the IBM Watson or the Alexa or kind of thing, right? So whenever find talk with the natural language processing, you will get into mind of these technologies. Yes, you are absolutely correct because these technologies are the core or the daily usage uh, visibility of natural language processing. That means in everyday life, we are every day we are using the uh, technology built up by natural language processing, and and uh, we are using it in on every basis. So the natural language processing is a field of computer science, AI, and computational linguistic. So it's a three kind of uh, subject. So we use the basic uh, computer science technology, mathematics, and uh, the different prob uh, mathematical probabilistic thing and uh, automata theory. And then we'll take the new advanced AI models like ML and DL, and we use the uh, traditional linguistic technologies to build a uh, NLP model. 
So now we now we have to know that why do we need to learn one more subject, natural language processing? You know, we already have a huge, innumerable number of subjects in computer science that we need to learn, and we it's a huge thing, computer science. So we have uh, like undifferentiated number of subjects which we can really touch and we can actually explore that. But why do we need a new thing in computer science? So when we talk about the future of communication, when we talk about the ease of communication, we are not only in a plan to make a easy, easier for a human machine communication, but also improving the human human communication. Now you will ask that, okay, I can understand like, when we're dealing with the robots, when we're dealing with the robotic, uh, any kind of instrument or the machine, we, we have to depend on the human machine communication, right? But when we talk about the, uh, why do we need human human communication? Because from like centuries and decades and all, we are, we are well behaved, we are well sophisticated to talk about own human being, but no, human human communication is very important and also NLP is helping in that. For example, when you are writing something on MS Word, so you can just switch on the Grammarly, for example, the Grammarly toolkit in the uh, MS Word and you are writing some letter and that Grammarly, which is a product of NLP, is actually helping you in a real time to improve your writing skill. That means if you are writing something in any language to a person, that language can be improved for a better understandability, for a better interpretability to the another human being. So that's the product of natural language processing. Machine translation, and it's a everyday usage of the machine translation, which is also a product of natural language processing. Now let us understand that why NLP is interesting. So language involves many human activities, right? Reading, writing, speaking, listening, and voices that we speak use can be a user interface in many applications. For example, for the uh, remote controls like virtual assistants like Siri, Alexa, and all these things we use our every day with our phone, with our um, personal assistant uh, appliances and all these things. So these are all depends on NLP. Now, for example, we, we use NLP to acquire insights from huge amount of data that we are generating every day. For example, from the medical records, from the health records, from example, the doctors, we are passing by the uh, different uh, patients and the different patients' beds and the uh, e-nurse, which is also somehow common in, in few hospitals in Korea and something like that. The e-nurse or the, it's, it's not typically the nurse, it's kind of a robot which uh, stands or which sits beside of uh, uh, kind of patients which actually store the everyday records and everything when a doctor makes the rounds around the patients and looking and they are just saying the, uh, telling the um, different uh, biomedical data, biomedical records to the, to save it instead of just writing it out and it saves and it analyzes whole day and it also checks with the regular in real time, uh, also in the real time uh, structure of the biomedical data, and it in uh, and it also uh, what can I say? It also analyze them and uh, make some productive results. So, but but I'll tell you that yes, we we need to learn about NLP, and NLP is uh, is everywhere right now. But still, NLP is hard. Now I'll tell you why NLP is hard and why do we need to learn NLP in a very deep way. For example, let's take a very famous example, like I made her duck. So this is a very small sentence, right? I made her duck. Now, now think that why NLP is really hard. I made her duck can be semantically in can be formed into different other form, uh, sentences. For example, I cooked waterfowl for her. A duck is the, like this, like a chicken kind of thing, right? So I cooked waterfowl for her, or I cooked waterfowl belong to her, or I created with a plastic or any machine or any kind of thing that she owns. 
or I caused her to quickly lower her aid. That means to duck something. I costly. Uh, I caused her to quickly lower her head or body to pass some bridge or something like that. I made her duck. Or I waved my magic wand and turned into an undifferentiated water fountain, which is a kind of uh, uh, impossible thing to a human being. But okay. Uh, this sentence can be semantically broken into five or more meaningful sentences, right? So, can you imagine this sentence, even for a human being, can be so ambiguous? That is, I made her duck and it can be differentiated. It can have many meanings, which is also very much disturbing or very confusing for a human being. Now think that how hard it is for a computer to understand. So to, to do research with NLP, you have to be very cautious about the different semantical meaning. So in the same way, the example like the I saw her duck, it can be like I saw her, she was ducking, or I saw her who was taking her duck for a walk, or the chicken is ready to eat. So when we say that the chicken is ready to eat, it either means that the chicken, the recipe of the chicken is ready, it is ready for it or the chicken is sitting in the dining table to eat, which is obviously not. But for a computer, it is undifferentiable. That is, computer cannot understand which is true or not. So for the computer, both the thing is correct. But we need to improve the NLP, we need to improve the model and the technology to for a better understanding of the machine. For example, call me a cab. Okay, you are a cab. So call me a cab means call a cab for me or, or my name is cab, call me a cab. So this way NLP is really hard. <clears throat> now another example, which is very funny and very, very famous example in NLP. So this example is why is NLP hard? <laughs> that means as the famous sentence is I shot an elephant in my pajama. So now this has two meaning. Either that I shot an elephant, why I am wearing a pajama, or I shot an elephant, which is wearing a pajama. But for a human being, the next, the next thing is impossible that an elephant cannot wear a pajama. But for a human being, the first one can be an answer. But for the computer, it is really confusing because for computer the elephant can be an animal or elephant can be any person whose name is elephant who is wearing a pajama or the person that is I is wearing the pajama and shooting the elephant. So, so in this way it is really very hard while we deal with the NLP from the core level in the computer. So for this thing, we do the parsing tree that I'll come in the latest slides. So it is not possible to cover the every parts of the NLP and the core technology of the NLP in one hour lecture, but uh, I'll try to uh, touch the every sort of the technologies and explain you that how we work with the NLP. So now natural languages are highly ambiguous that we told you, that I told you, right? So we, we have different kinds of words meaning, we have different kinds of syntactic meaning, semantic meaning, and obviously the discourse level. So natural languages are fuzzy. That is, when we talk about the examples like the, the I shot an elephant in, our, in my pajama, so it's, it was very unlikely that the elephant wears a pajama, but it is likely for me to be wearing a pajama while shooting the elephant. So, but it is ambiguous for the computer. Although the, we, we came to know and talk about the NLP in recent times, but NLP is not new. The, the, the main foundation of the NLP started in the early 1950s. So when the first automation theories and different, uh, different paradigms like probabilistic and information theoretical models were built in 1950s, it started since then. That time was not exactly the NLP, but it was starting of the linguistic. So from the linguistic model or precisely the computational linguistic models, which started, then we have in 1970s and 1980s, we have different stochastic paradigm, logic-based paradigm, language 
ANLU, which is the natural language understanding, and also the different finite state models, which which uh, which built up in the early nineties and late eighties. So the rise of with the rise of machine learning algorithms from the two thousands, the NLP algorithm, the NLP become very popular because when we because in the nineties or the in the in the late nineties or the early two thousands we have a huge number of data we have like from there is a transition from the floppy disk to the uh, to the uh, cd rom then the dvd rom then the pen drive disk drive then the solid state devices and all these things with this with this kind of transitions we have a storage capability of a huge number and with a large number of storing capabilities we have a huge data we available to us so with this data we and with the help of the machine learning algorithms which were rising at that time and it was it was a transition part for the or the it was a kind of renaissance for the nlp period so where is the nlp right now now you should know that you can say okay we have we have achieved every part of nlp no if we consider the NLP, we have divided into three different stages, like the machine consciousness, which is a stage one, which we have already covered in the in the NLP evolution, then the machine intelligence, which we have already covered, and the machine learning, that is the third stage with the different Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and all these things. Now you should ask that we already have developed Siri, Alexa, and Cortana. So aren't we here? No, we are not here at this stage at, in terms of NLP. In terms of the stages of AI, we are still here in the machine intelligence because Siri, Alexa, Cortana, this is still under development and it is not yet so much advanced that we use. But yes, uh, it is quite uh, usable right now. We can use Siri, Alexa and everything in our daily life. So how does AI and NLP link? So the AI is a sub, uh, subfield of computer science, which is a kind of interdisciplinary subject. And when we talk about the text processing, speech processing, we can say, okay, we can already do, we can already work with the speech processing, with the signal processing thing. We can already work with the text processing, with the different data mining technology. Then why do we need the NLP? When we talk about the speech, that is a voice, direct voice, and we we have we need some real time technology to understand that meaning of the voice, not the technological or the signal processing part of things. Then we need the NLP. When we need the text data, mostly the textual data that is unstructured data, we have to work with. Then we have to need the NLP. So NLP can work on huge amount of data and large amount of data requires more NLP expertise. So right now NLP is everywhere, every other company. For example, if you or your students may start learning about NLP, so there's a huge prospect for the next two decades indeed for the, um, for the career in the NLP. Like every second company right now is using the NLP in, in some part of the order of their business model. For example, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and everyone is using the NLP for everyday purposes. Now let's dig deeper into the NLP and see like little technological part and with the help of some of the examples that why, how does we uh, use NLP in our daily life? So why do we need to learn NLP? So for example, you are, park, you are going through a car, you are going in your car or in a bus and you would just listen to some song, just a middle of a song, like only two or three sentences or maybe just a sentence in the middle of a whole song and you don't understand you don't and you don't know the uh, the starting point of the song there's a mukha of the song right so what you do you you cannot and you cannot search that song or you don't want to search that song what you do you just ask your alexa or your siri to just search and find that song and listening to that only that part it will try to find that song instantly for you from all over the internet. 
So this was the best example that we use every day now, virtual assistants, like we use a CD, Alexa, Google Assistant, and all these things for our everyday uh, easiness. So sentiment analysis, text classification, chatbots are also the examples of NLP, which we use every day. And different sectors that we use, for example, the banking, insurance, healthcare, retail, we use everywhere this NLP this time. I will, uh, in, the, in the last part of my lecture, I will also give you a huge description, which you can take a screenshot, where you can get a lot of uh, research areas where you start working on NLP, you can finish your whole PhD as well. So let's take an example of this uh, demo. I don't know whether it will, uh, you will hear, will, you will know the uh, sound or not. So this is a small uh, example, like how we use Alexa on a everyday basis. I know a lot of people have the Alexa with you, but it's it's an example like how we are more dependent on NLP in our daily life. We can call our Alexa to switch on the fan, switch on the TU and every, appliances in our home are right now the smart appliances and we we control we we ask them uh to run to slow down to to get faster to change the channel to have a volume up volume down it has everything what we just with the help of one, asking the alexa it can be alexa or a google home or kind of any kind of alexa. thing Turn on channel nine Alexa, it's cold. Alexa, it's cold. So when it when it just say that Alexa, it's cold, the air condition automatically Alexa, switched off. So 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 it, it's like that. So it's not only it not only uh, listen to your demand. It not only listen to your uh, questions. It also understands your feelings. It also understands the thing that you are you really want to express to the different parts. That means, for example, when we're asking for the Alexa, I'm not feeling well, the Alexa try to understand my mood and try to cheer me up with some of the new, some of the good news or some of the jokes or some of the nice music. It try to cheer me up. So this, this is how we actually, uh, these uh, kind of NLP thing is important. And, and this is, this is our uh, responsibility, the, the responsibility of the computer scientists to improve this thing for a better tomorrow. Alexa. NLP is everywhere because the textual data or any kind of data which requires NLP is everywhere. So this is the just generic uh, structure that I have taken from the Google randomly today. And uh, it says that for every one minute, just think, just every one minute, it's 3.3 million Facebook posts are being posted. 500 hours of YouTube videos are uploaded just for one minute. More than 29 million WhatsApp messages are seen just in just one minute. And more than 65,000 posts are being uh, uploaded in the Instagram. So can you imagine the huge number of data it's exponential, it's, it's not only exponential, it's more than exponentially increasing every day, just in uh, in a just blink of seconds. And all these data are being stored in the cloud somewhere in the world. And we are we are we are all super fluently this data, we are all overflowed with this data. And we, the data scientists, we need to dig out the this, we need to understand this data, we need to dig out, uh, dig in into this data that we actually uh, we actually need to understand that what the whole world is doing right now. To understand the entire world, we understand the mentality, to understand the psychology of the human being, we have an ample opportunity to understand this all these things. And believe me, all these things are publicly available. All these things are publicly available data. So we, we can use our NLP technology to understand and do a lot of things. And these things need. So for that thing, the more and more stable and robust NLP algorithms is very much needed. 
So, so let us see some of the everyday examples of NLP. So as I told you, the email filters, which we always do every day for previously, there was, for example, only one email filter. For example, the email has no proper salutation. The email has no proper address, proper signature or proper uh, characterization. Then the email automatically goes into the spam folder. But nowadays, the Google has uh, also more technology that it can also sort your emails in different parts, like the updates, forums, an official and whatever the uh, whatever the tag you want to add, it will automatically uh, categorize your email before you open it. That means your G your Google uh, server reads your email even much before than you do. So they just read your whole email messages and in a blink of second, it just read all your thing and apply the NLP, understand the message, understand than the context of the message and send it and categorize it to a kind of uh, class that it's a, okay, it's an updates email. It's a kind of promotion email. It's kind of forums email that comes from different social media or something like that. So this is how we actually, uh, emails are being filtering and NLP is helping us in every day. Smart assistant, which I already told you like, different thing like the Siri, Alexa, Google uh, Assistant, Cortana, and all these things are helping us every day nowadays and we are more dependent on this. We have to ask something, we just say like, hey Google, hey Siri, or hey Alexa, we just uh, tell, tell me these things and we are getting everything in just a blink of a second. So we, don't, we are not relying also on the type and Google search with these things. This is another example. So can anybody just tell me that if they are able to listen to the last video, then I will play it again. This is an yes, example. Sir, we could hear. Okay, 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 thank you. Then, then just try to listen to this uh, audio clip. So this is a very, very uh, unique and very, uh, very nice uh, example of the how advanced the NLP has become nowadays. So this is an example of the latest uh, version of the Google Assistant, where the Google Assistant is so smart nowadays, they can not only they can uh, uh, dictate something, they can already talk to a person in a real time, in a real person with a real tone. And they have some real human expressions and all these things. They can, uh, they can take the decision also, they can, uh, they can understand, they can decide, and they can uh, they can do the task that you have ordered uh, it to be done. So just listen to it. Here, uh, here actually, for example, the person instructed his Google Assistant to book a hotel, book a restaurant for for say three or four person for some particular day or date. And the Google Assistant, in the meantime, in any time of the day, whatever, the Google Assistant automatically in the background, automatically call the uh, real hotel manager and book it for it. Just see. Can I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to give a table for one day seven. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, uh, actually, we need to go like after like uh, five people. For four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the 7th. Oh, no, it's not too busy. You, you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. So see, here, here the Google Assistant is actually talking like a real person and it gives some real colloquial expression like a normal human being while talking to the real uh, hotel manager for the booking of the person. So, so it's not only just takes nowadays, NLP is helping the 
different technologists like not only only sending a text message to the hotel that please book a room or book a table for four person on next Wednesday at 7 p.m. It also talks to them in the mint in the background when you are not present and it can talk like a person. So this is just a small example of the current technological advancement of NLP. So this is another example, every example of the NLP we use. That is a search letter. That is auto completion, right? Whenever we start to write, when we start to write like how to, and we, we get to get the whole kinds of, uh, we'll, we'll get to get the whole kinds of uh, sentence automatically coming in the Google. So when you start typing something over Google that, okay, how to do this? And it's show, show us all the probable, the next sentence or the next word we, we may uh, need to search for, right? So the search engine uses NLP in a real time to help us understand the, uh, understand our search or to help us uh, getting our uh, results in a very, uh, very easy way. Language translation. Language translation is one of the like the uh, tremendous uh, revolutionary uh, changes that makes L, uh, that makes the human life easier. For example, uh, for example, the NL, For example, when we when we are talking in a real time, so. Uh, so it, it's like a savior for the person who lives like for me, the person uh, living in South Korea, I don't I don't talk in Korean much. So for me, it's like a savior for me while I'm traveling and I'm doing everything just with the help of Google Translator or the Papa Go translation. So so, for example, mm, uh, OK, I, OK, I'll reply to you. So to, to talk to the hotel manager. For example, you just say, for example, the Google Assistant, just say the Google Assistant that, okay, Google Assistant, please reserve a hotel for me or restaurant table for me for this person this day of time. You just store the information, just saying or typing whatever you want to do. And the Google Assistant will do the rest to book that, okay? So the machine, the machine language translation or the machine translation is a huge thing. So the magical part of the machine translation or the language translation is that it not only translate word by word, it also try, it also try to maintain the uh, linguistic structures. It also try to maintain the structure of the word. For example, uh, the grammar in every language is different. For example, in some language, the verb comes in between, for in other language, the verbs comes at last, right? So. For example, in English, we, we put verb in the middle, but in Hindi, Bengali, or in most in, in Indian languages, we put verb at the last. So this is the difference between the these things. But NLP is so, so advanced, the machine translation is so smart these days that it can really, it not only translate that thing exactly in the uh, another language, but also try to maintain the grammatical structure of the language. Text analytics or the sentiment analysis or, I mean, the text analysis involves a lot of different things. So in the text analysis, we use the sentiment analysis, which you have already know a lot of things about that. And we use uh, different uh, reviews, different, feedbacks, different uh, comments to understand the human behavior, to understand the human psychology, to understand the uh, human views and their sentiments about something or other. So all these are the examples of NLP. So now just let us just explore this some technical part of the NLP, but in a very short I will not take much of your time. So in a very short, uh, I'll explain the core part of the NLP. So, so for example, when we start learning NLP, the most important and the basic four parts which you need to learn just for starting. Okay, if you want to start NLP from today and you want to, uh, you want to, uh, you want to understand that how 
how we we actually help in uh, understanding a language you can take any random data from the github or something you can any date you, you can take any simple code from github or something and run in python or something and you can you can you, if you if you learn this only four parts you can do the basic nlp task so the basic four nlp tasks are the word segmentation pos tagging syntactic analysis and semantic analysis so i will explain very shortly about each or one of them. So what is what segmentation? So what segmentation, we usually call this as tokenization when we talk in the NLP terms. So what segmentation is a tokenization. So in, but there is a problem in some languages. For example, in Japanese, for example, in Vietnamese, there was either no space between the words or a word may contain the smaller syllables. So in that sense, the computer gets problems. So they don't understand that word, where the a, word ends or the where the word will end. So for this kind of problem, so we have a possible solution is a called a maximum matching problem. So when we have a maximum matching problem, that means we have a kind of dictionary with us and we have a kind of uh, already pre pre uh, preloaded uh, hash values with us, and we try to search the same words by words with, to try to find that which word is actually matching the sentences. For example, in this in this Vietnamese sentence, that's not one loan. I ca I cannot read Vietnamese, but I can just read it out. So in this sentence, we don't know that uh, what this sentence word is it is not ban or not ban so both are actually the legal words so when we talk about the not ban luo is the sentence we see that the not ban is a word in a dictionary but not lat ban luon is so that means this is a word and here it ends so we can segment this word with the help of Ma maximum matching but for english it does not have any problem for hindi bengali it does not have any problem because we have proper system of space between each of the words the next thing after the word tokenizer or the word segmentation we usually have to apply the pos tagging so actually these are the steps for example when we start learning nlp for the first time you need to understand that what are the basic steps we need to learn so nlp is a huge thing it's it's a year long semester long or two semester long subjects which you can learn and it has a huge uh, dimension to learn on but um, to start with you can uh, you can take these small steps like the word segmentation pos tagging the syntactic analysis and semantic analysis. If you just try to learn these four different things, I promise you, you can learn NLP from today as well. Or you can also work on NLP. So I will also share my book that I have written on NLP. So you can uh, you can also get that book and uh, you can learn about the NLP in a very easy way. So PS tagging, it's called the parts of speech tagging. So first part was what segmentation, that is, tokenization that means we have a sentence we tokenize the word that means we segment the word by word one of them and we keep those words as a entity we call them as an entity small small words okay and we call them as terms now what we have to do now as a normal human being also need to understand the grammar of the uh, sentence computer also needs to know the grammar of the sentence and what was the first thing we need to learn of in a grammar? It's the parts of speech. That is noun, pronoun, adjective, and all these things. Computer also needs to learn the PUS. That is a parts of speech. So we have to tag each term, each word, and with its corresponding parts of speech tags. For example, the sentence that is that the grand jury commented on a number of other topics. So when we apply the POS tagging over here, we actually tagging the parts of speech for each word. For example, the is a 
article or determinant. The grant is an adjective. The jury is a noun. The commented is a verb. On is an interjection. A is again an article or a determinant. Number is a noun and so on. So in this way, first we tag, we, we tokenize each word. Then we assign the parts of speech tags to each word. Okay. So the two states are gone. Sometimes there is one technology in parts of speech tagging. We call it as a sequence leveling. So what is sequence leveling? There are some problem in some sentences where the parts of speech or the POS tagging can be a problematic. For example, the sentence that is John saw the saw and decided to take it to the table. John saw the saw and decided to take it to the table. Now here for a human being, it is confusing, but still we know that the second saw is a kind of saw, a kind of instrument which, which helps to cut a uh, iron or cuts a wood or something like that, okay? So the John is a person who saw the saw, that is the instrument to cut the wood and decide to take it to the table. Maybe it was on the floor and it can cause a accident. So it's uh, decide to take it to the table. But for a computer, what is John is a noun, saw is a verb, saw is a verb, decide is a verb and all these things it needs to learn. But when we talk about the sequence labeling, when we talk about the sequence labeling, we do a kind of windowing thing. That is a kind of sliding window thing. That is John saw the saw and decide to take it to the table. We do the first window over here and we see that the John is a noun, saw is a verb, the is a determinant, and next saw is a noun. Then now how? Because the verb never comes after the, right? So if a verb is there just after the determinant, then it must be a noun. So this is how we, we make the computer understand that the first saw is a verb and the second saw must be something which is called at saw. So in this way, either by the no, in the normal way or in a complicated sentence like this, we do a sequence leveling and in this way, we'll do a parts of speech tagging. And the third step is the syntax analysis. So syntax analysis is very important. Because uh, in every uh, programming language, we know that we, we used to get a lot of syntax error, right? So when we get a lot of syntax errors, uh, which comes like for full stop, comma, semicolon, question mark, exclamation marks, and all these things, here also syntactic, syntactic analysis or syntax analysis is very important. For example, my dog likes eating sausages. So syntax analysis is what? So first, what we do, we tokenize each word over here. Then what we do, we assign the parts of speech. Then we try to see that the, that the sentence is properly structured or not. That the my dog likes sauces also eating. Is it a correct syntax? No. Then my dog also likes eating sauces. Okay, this is a correct and it ends with a stop. So this is the correct. So we use the parsing tree technology with the help of parsing tree technology, we used to do the syntactic analysis. That is, we first start from the sentence, then we will the noun form, then adverb form, and then finally at the root level, we are, I'm sorry, at the leaf level, we find the final parts of speech. That is, my is a preposition, dog is a noun, eating is a verb, and sausage is an, another noun. So all this way, we actually uh, assign the parts of speech as well as we structure this tree. But this tree can be different from one to another. So one single sentence can have many tree as well. So that's a challenging part that you have to take care of while you do the uh, syntactic analysis. There is a problem with ambiguity, ambiguous nature, that is ambiguity problem that I told you that one sentence can have many parsing tree. So we have to understand, the. we need to uh, code the uh, 
NLP model in such a way that the computer can actually end up in the correct or closely correct parsing tree because there can be more than one correct parsing tree as well. For example, the example, what books were written by the British women authors before 1800? So this sentence is very complicated. What, just try to listen again. What books were written by the British women authors before 1800? So now this, now this sent, sorry, now this sentence has many questions behind it. So to understand these questions by a computer, for example, if you ask your Alexa that what books were written by British women authors before 1800, the Alexa needs to apply the smart NLP technology to first identify the books which were published before 1800, then which were published in Britain and where the authors are only women. So they have to segregate all these things and finally the subset of the results will be the final output right so this kind of complicated sentence are very important to deal with while we talk about the nlp one while we are building the nlp model then the final part after the syntactic analysis is a semantic analysis and it is the most important part of every kind of NLP analysis for the basic NLP analysis. Semantic analysis is a understanding the meaning that the how computer understand that what you are trying to say. Okay, we understand that syntax is correct. Now, what if the syntax is correct and what does it imply? What it try to say? So when we talk about the sem semantic analysis, we can do the semantic analysis in two level, the lexical level and compositional level. The lexical level represents the meaning of the word. That is, for example, what is your name? The meaning of what? Meaning of is? Meaning of your? Meaning of name? The a kind of word basis level. And compositional semantic is the meaning of the whole sentence as a, or the whole sentence as a whole, the, the complete meaning. For example, the Maharani serves the vegetarian food. So we use the first order predicate calculus for the uh, lexical level semantic analysis. That is, we first choose the verbs. That is, serves. Who serves? Maharani. What serves? Vegetarian food. Same way, I only have $5 and I don't have a lot of time. So I, So here we have two sentences, right? Two independent sentences. This can be end with a full stop or this can be joined with a conjunction. So we, we take the conjunction and over here and we, we take the first verb have and second verb not have. That is the don't have. So what we have, first who we have, the speaker that is I and what we have is the $5. And what I don't have, who I don't have, the I and what I don't have, the lot of time. So use of first order predicate calculus is very important to understand the each meaning of this sentence to segregate the sentence on the basis of the verbs forms. Why this language understanding is important? Just for example, here this person is speaking to his dog whose name is Ginger and he's instructed like, okay, Ginger, I have had it all. You stayed out of the garbage. Understand Ginger stay out of the garbage or else. And he's scolding his dog a lot and his dog was so innocent. He just listened like blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 blah. So to that dog, the Ginger is the only word which he understand. Because every time he listened to the word Ginger, he know ah, that is my name and he go. And he don't understand all these things. So, so language understanding is a very important. So our goal is for deep understanding, which requires high con understanding of the context, high understanding of the linguistic structures and linguistic semantics. But the reality is very important because in the reality, the, the matching is not always very deep way. In the, it requires very robustness and amazing uh, NLP models for a better understanding. But 
till now at least in 2022 we are standing right now and we have uh, quite good NLP models available in our market and uh, our Siri, Alexa and Google Assistant, all these things are working quite well. So for the NLP analysis, I prefer Python programming language. To start with, you can use a Python programming language because like uh, there are a huge number of uh, libraries are already available in the Pythons. Uh, for the NLP packages and the NLTK packages, everything are available. It provides an extensive collection of tools and libraries to, uh, to use a great number of uh, NLP functions. And it has uh, a good uh, POS staggers and all these things. So you can use the NLP. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you can use a Python for the NLP. So let's now see some of the real-time also examples that uh, which we can work with the NLP. So these are the very basic and the most important examples where we can build a chat box, information retrieval algorithms, information extraction algorithm, question answering algorithm, text summarization, and machine translation. This has a very well-defined problems, but also I will give you a huge collection of problems which you, even if you choose just one, you can finish your whole thesis. So we all know the chat box. Chat box are the very usable things which right now all the websites are using almost like they use uh, the chat box in that. So chatbot can be two types. One is the AI built chat box, another one is the MLDL based chat box. So AI based chat box is like just if else things like which you have already fit some of the predefined answers. If you have, if you uh, if you go to the question, if you do the question, they will answer the uh, predefined uh, uh, response from its uh, dictionary, and they will uh, you will get the answer from the chat box. But email and DL based chat box are a little difficult to build, but actually people are also using the chat box where you can act, where you can get an experience of a real time customer care executive or customer representatives where. Uh, the chat box is usually, usually talks like that of the example which we have listened to that of the Google Assistant. So that's the email DL based chat box. This is a basic rule based chat box works, which I told you that the rule based means like if L based, that is the AI based chat box. Uh, I think we have less time, so I'll just move forward. And the second example is the question answering, which is also very uh, import, important aspect to build on the uh, part that how we can actually uh, uh, understand the different aspects of a uh, technology with the help of question answering system. Take summarization with a very important uh, example or a very important application what we can, uh, we can work on on different types of, uh, to understand the different types of big documents. For example, the text summarization technology can be applied to the legal documents because to to read a 300 or 500 page uh, document is very important, uh, very difficult. And to if you, if you just write a small Python code, which can do a text summarization with the help of the preloaded -pre NLP model, and if you apply that on a huge document or a huge story or a huge novel, then it will automatically, in a blink of a second, it will automatically learn the every part of the document and it will return the summarized text to you so that you can at least understand that what is behind that 500 page document. And these are all done by NLP. Machine translation, which we have already told that how machine, how we write in the real time and how we get the results in, in our foreign language in a real time. So here I write something in English, it, uh, it supply me with the same thing in a Korean. So these are the another enterprise level examples of an NLP. You can take a short screen, uh, quick screenshots and you can, you can take if any of one of the research area you pick, you can actually finish your PhD thesis in this area. So these are, really uh, uh, 
uh, helpful research areas which are not much well explored till now in the area of NLP. So these are all open area right now. So how to learn NLP? So first you should have a, some prerequisite knowledge about probability and statistic and basic linear algebra and calculus knowledge, machine learning knowledge, and obviously programming, preferably in Python, but you can also work with R and other languages as well. It's up to you. So to learn the NLP, uh, you can either uh, read the book by the Daniel Jurovsky, which is a very famous book on the speech and language processing. And you can also read my book on natural language processing. So uh, I, I, will share, I will show you my book over here now. After this, uh, okay, just uh, let me show you the book. Mm. Share contained. Uh, just a minute, I'm just sharing. So this, yeah, so this is the book that I, I wrote last year for the, uh, not the last year in 2020 for the, uh, this book is uh, not for sale, actually. You cannot get this book on Flipkart, Amazon or anywhere because this is a, this book has been published by government of Korea as the uh, university level textbook for all the university in South Korea. This is the uh, compulsory textbook for all the uh, masters and PhD level uh, students in South Korea. So I written this book and the book is very, uh, very much uh, uh, covered all the mostly all the topics in NLP. So as I told you, this is a government of Korea book. So it is not for sale, not for any kind of reproduction. So if you need this book, you can, uh, it's a 400 page complete book on NLP. If you need this book, then you can email me and I can personally share this book with you. So, so I'll just, uh, I'll just share this last part of my, this is uh, last part, yeah. So, so you can, yeah. So you can practice uh, the NLP. Uh, there are hundreds of hundreds of examples already in the GitHub. So you can just randomly go to the GitHub. You can take some, random codes and copy paste them on Python and just practicing. While you do more and more practice, you can really, uh, really improve your NLP skills. So I finish now and I'll talk about a little bit about my university. This is my university, Tongyang University. This is based in the uh, southeast part of the South Korea. It's a very beautiful city of Busan with the age of the Pacific Ocean and the mountains. And this is my university campus. And uh, I have a small lab in uh, university, uh, in my university called Chatterjee's New Reimagining and AI Lab. Currently I have 10 in-lab students and two uh, external students. And, uh, and the, all these uh, 10 students contains uh, like four PhD students working with me and two RA and three masters and all these things. And all these people are working mostly on the part of uh, computational neuroscience, schizophrenia, and the NLP, and the sentiment analysis, uh, time series analysis, mostly all deals with like uh, machine learning and deep learning kinds of things. So my most research area is like comp computational neuroscience. So if you want to know more about me, you can go to my uh, lab page, that's science.google.com, view in the strategy. You can visit my uh, official homepage, or you can visit my um, uh, university page as well. So this is my email ID, indrana.cs.u at gmail.com. And this is my uh, web uh, lab page. So if you want to learn more about me, if you want to learn my papers, my books, and uh, if you want to get the PDF of my books, you can visit my uh, uh, lab page as well. So if you have any question, anything, you can email me anytime. So thank you for listening. And I hope that uh, my voice is, my throat is still now very much infected with COVID. So my, uh, I had a very bad time continually talking for one hour, but I hope that uh, I'm well audible to you 
because I can I cannot uh, speak louder today. So thank you for considering. Thank thank you thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nachetar sir. It was a very nice and very interactive lecture. Uh, now I, I would like to request to our participants if they have any kind of query. They, uh, the session is open for the question and answers. Participants, hello, sir. Kind of query? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, uh, does the NLP, when we uh, write the NLP program, will it be easy in uh, supervised le learning, uh, uh, sir? Like if the agent is supervised age uh, uh, and uh, comes under supervised learning, then NLP programming will, programming will be more easier, sir? Uh, it, it depends on the application area. For example, if you're working with some data, which you have all kinds of ample amount of data and with the classified or the label data you have, then it's 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 good that you use a supervised learning because uh, it's 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 always acceptable that supervised learning has a very good efficiency. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Uh, I'm uh, looking for the. Uh, uh, like a, a research paper, sir, because I wanted to do PhD in this. Uh, so, any sources for uh, getting the research papers, sir? Uh, you you can contact me, or you can uh, you can go to my homepage. You can get okay. uh, my books and my research papers, all the PDFs over there, and you can also uh, uh, email me if you need any help. So, my PhD students are also working on NLP, so you can uh, I can help you in that. Thank you, sir. Any more queries, participants? Any queries? Any doubt? <coughs> House is open for question and answers. You can write in chat box also if you have mic issues. Yeah, he will share his slides. So please share your slides also with me so that I can share uh, with the participants. Okay, sure. Any more queries? Sir, is there any opportunity for the Indian faculties or students to do some uh, kind of uh, uh, visit workshop, uh, schooling, uh, like summer programs at your university? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities for the exchange, pro exchange programs for the students as well as for the research scholars uh, to visit the university as a visiting scholars or visiting students. So you can you can just uh, that thing is not under my uh, delegation. So you can uh, you can visit the international affairs uh, page of the web uh, of the website of the university website. You there will see there are a lot of openings for the uh, foreign uh, students visit or the as exchange student or the exchange researchers. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. More queries? Any more? Indeed, it was a great lecture, sir. I know uh, there was a problem with your health. So you are not feeling well. Still, you have given us your valuable time. It's a pleasure for us, sir. Okay, now I would like to call Dr. Abhishek. Dr. Abhishek, are you there? Abhishek, sir? Yes, sir. So my, my voice is clear. Yeah, yeah, please. Ah, yes, sir, my voice is clear. Yes. Hello. Your voice Hello. is clear. Your voice is clear. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay fine, sir. Okay, thank you very much, sir. It is my honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks. I, on behalf of Department of Computer Science, Indra Gandhi National Tribal University, Amarkanda, would like to thank Professor Indranath Chatterjee, sir, to deliver a lecture on natural language processing. Sir, in this talk, you discuss about the importance of communication and how it is important in various other streams like computational linguistics. You discuss the importance of NLP in various applications such as robotics, Grammarly, Alexa, email filtering, and machine translation. You discuss about how the NLP hard and with the various uh, good examples. You also presented the importance of NLP with live video demonstration. You also explain various challenges in the NLP which will be beneficial for new researcher. So really this lecture was very wonderful and uh, our participant has definitely gained a lot of knowledge from this lecture. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivered a lecture even which suffered from the COVID. 
Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Dishing and Dr. Pawan. It's, it's really my pleasure to be here. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a lovely audience and all of the, all of the people over Sir, here. Sir, I am very thankful. Yes, because it is, uh, it, is, it is not much common in other FDPs where the uh, participants yeah, are sure, so sir. much active in the late evening or the afternoon sessions. But I'm really happy that these participants are really very much active and asking questions. And I'm really happy because when you have a very interactive session, when you have an active participant, the teacher or the you, you, you both are professors, you all know that it, it gives us good feeling to give a speech. So thanks to you and, and really congratulations for organizing a very good session for the uh, students and research scholars. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for giving your valuable time and support to us. Thank you very much. Thank have you. Have a nice day and nice health, sir. Take some rest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Sir, that was a very informative and scintillating speech by Professor Vimala Chatterjee. It was really uh, good to have you as our speaker. And we were really inspired about the way in which the approach and the flow that you took it, uh, you know, to deliver the content to us. It was, it was very nice to have you, sir. Thank you very much. It was uh, well conducted indeed. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Such a good uh, resource person available for yeah. us. Sure, sure, sure. For anything, you can contact me anytime. Yeah, I'll 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 mark a mail to you, sir. I'll be in touch. Sure, thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Chairman, sir. Thank you. Thank thank you so much. Much. Okay, participant, just fill the feedback form. Okay. Have a nice day. And now I'm stopping the meeting. Okay. Okay, sir. If you have, if you have any carries, ask to me. Sir, yeah, Bisek, sir. Sir. Any doubt? Sir, uh, can you uh, email ID, sir? Yeah, yeah. I will, I will send. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Thank sir, you. one, sir. One, sir. Yes, sir. One small, one small uh, query, sir. One small question. Like, uh, are we trying to gather all the slides that is being used by the professors to be shared by the with the audience, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, whatever they send, I I I'll just send in Telegram. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thanks for the effort. Thank you. Appreciated. Much appreciated, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Okay, Chatterjee sir has sent his email ID. Let me send in chat box also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, I will say I, I I will say on Telegram link also. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Please fill the feedback form and fill the attendance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yesterday's holiday. Who's asking? Thank you, sir. There is there is no holiday at all. Okay, Friday. Uh, Okay, we have 10 to 4, then 4 to 5, there, is, there will be the valid, validatory and feedback sessions. Okay, you can put your feedback over there. 4 to 5, okay, there is a validatory session. So I request you all, will be there at a validatory session also. And tomorrow is the last session? Tomorrow, 10 to 4, yes. Tomorrow will be the last day. Okay, sir. Okay, so we'll be there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me end the meeting, okay? Add it out. Should I end the meeting? We will meet at 10, 10 o'clock sharp in morning. Okay? Okay, sir. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, could you uh, send the attendance link of the 